So I'm excited to introduce Zahidul, Dr. Zahidul Hussein today. Um, Dr. Hussein is a new postdoc in my lab working with Jennifer and I on our urban deer movement study. Um, before coming here, or maybe a long time ago, was an undergraduate at the University of Delhi and then did his master's at Dune University in India where he studied um, an endangered wild sheep called a Ural. Uh, and then he did his, after this, he was there for about the last six or seven years at the Wildlife Institute of India, maybe longer, yeah. six or seven years. Yeah, at the Wildlife Institute of India studying tigers for his PhD, which is a big portion of what he'll talk about today. So I won't steal any of his thunder and I will hand it over. Uh, thank you very much, Travis. And without getting into much detail, I'll just, uh, as he has introduced me, so this is a part of my PhD research project in India, uh, which uh, tried to understand the, you know, the movement and behavior of large carnivores, tigers, in a, in a multi-use landscape. Uh, in the current in the country, current Anthropocene, we know that uh, 70 per, 75 percent of the Earth landscape is dominated by humans or human activities. Uh, consequently, this has this mod human altered landscape has modified most of the uh, terrestrial ecosystems. And as a result of this modification, as you can see in the in the map, uh, most of the areas in in the Central Asia or Northern Europe, uh, parts of Russia, China. And northern, uh, you know, uh, northern uh, Canada or Eastern America, most of the parts are, you know, dominated by human modifications. Consequently, uh, these modifications have also led to, you know, influence the global human, uh, sorry, global animal movement in terms of reducing their, uh, um, uh, reducing their movement of the terrestrial mammals. So this, uh, this uh, human modifications have not only influenced. Uh, humans uh, like during the COVID, but also they have modified how this uh, you know, global carnivore movement in and around the globe. For example, if you take off large carnivores because of their larger home range and movement, they are particularly influenced by habitat fragmentations, uh, human developmental activities such as urbanization, agriculture, and, and, and it also, you know, other infrastructure developments such as road development, for example, in the development countries. They also act as a barrier to this large carnivore movement. And at the last, uh, habitat fragmentation can act as a loss of connectivity between different patches, and then, and as a result, it can build up uh, isolated, fragmented patches. Uh, this is also happening with my study species, that tigers. Uh, in the last 80 years, uh, around uh, of the nine subspecies, three subspecies has already been gone extinct, and then, and and currently. Uh, the total only 93 percent population, 97 percent population has been wiped out globally. Only 3 percent population remain in the wild, and India holds around 70 to 75 percent of the to total tiger population. So in the wild, we have roughly around 4,500 to 5,000 tigers in the wild. And uh, going back to the the scenario in Indian, so the in 2006 we had estimated the first tiger population. Which was around 1411, and and thankfully after 15 years it is around estimated to be around 3000 to 3500, and this is because of you know government policies, uh, conservation efforts. So with this background, uh, tigers in India are found in mostly protected areas and outside PAs. So protected areas are basically national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, uh, which I will talk more later in my slides. And overall, all, all, among the population, most of the tigers are found in PAs and some part, like 35%, they reside outside these PAs. Uh, 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 research has shown that these PAs are not enough to sustain a uh, healthy tiger population for a long time. So uh, it is important to now understand like their movement and behavior when these tigers move from one forest patch to another. This is important because in the long run, uh, they have to maintain genetic diversity and, and in terms of metapopulation and then and avoid inbreeding to sustain this population over long run. So taking this in background, my PhD research was to understand this movement of tigers from one forest patch to another during different life cycles 
and how this uh, how this behavior and movement are influenced by different you know uh, environmental and anthropogenic factors this presentation is uh, roughly talks about three basic uh, categories the first category is the movement and space use so i try to understand the different types of movement patterns for example say is there a variation in movement rate or whether tiger move faster in pas or vice versa in outside pa whether tiger move faster at night or day what uh, features influence their movement patterns uh, the second section that my thesis deals with understanding their behavior like is behavior uh, influenced by external factors and if yes what are they and the third is like the resource selection uh, for example if a tiger moves from say a pa to outside pa or moving through a agricultural landscape so what uh, factors as or governs their uh, habitat selection so uh, just giving you a, a you know view of the study area so this study area uh, is in the central part of uh, india and and it, it this region holds the largest population of tiger population in india and my study area has both pas and outside pas where you find tigers and other associated wildlife species and roughly it has around 450 tigers in the landscape so coming to the protected area regime like how how they are how they work like it's similar to the national parks in us so protected areas are, uh, has different categories of uh, pas for example national parks wildlife sanctuaries and these are mostly uh, well protected well managed and they are very least uh, uh, human activities permitted um, inside these parks and outside PAs are also forested areas, but these are they have very uh, relaxed, uh, you know, laws and regulations. Uh, these are mostly found in a matrix of human interface in near to a settlements, and and they are highly fragmented and they are they are subjected to most of the human disturbances. So we try to call it these individuals in different systems, PAs and outside PAs. Over the, over the over the between the years 2016 to 2022 and we tried to first uh, you know track tigers through camera traps understand their movement and then we immobilize them from a vehicle top and then feed the collars and track them until they are established individuals so coming to the first section of my uh, research is the spaces and movement patterns so i identified uh, tiger movement basically into dispersing and non-dispersing. So dispersing uh, patterns is that when these tigers are, you know, in, in, in a stage of adulthood, they will move out from their parent or the natal territory and they will move out of their trait, uh, natal area to in search of new habitat and mates. So you can see this is, say, for example, this is a forest area. This is a mother's territory. The tiger moves out of it. They move to a human dominated landscape with roads and other you know, metrics of land uses. And then finally, they establish a home a space, home range in a different area. So this process is dispersal process. And this, this where they live inside within with the mother is defined as pre-dispersal phase. And once they find a stable area and have a stable home range, we define as a post-dispersal phase. So we found that uh, tigers, uh, they have a faster movement and more movement in uh, especially in outside PAs as you can see this twice of the uh, displacement rate inside PA as well as the movement rate was higher at night overall we also found that 32 percent of displacement were higher in outside PA during night and and further I wanted to see what factors govern these uh, you know, uh, movement patterns like why these tigers are moving faster in PAs or vice versa so what we found that uh, what we found that is like uh, factors like uh, you know hum, uh, uh, human settlements uh, forest cover or size of the forest uh, then distance to roads they influence these movement patterns for example uh, if a, if a, if tigers are very close to human settlements they decrease their movement like you can see the graph here and same yeah, they decreases their movement rate when they are in a forested area and have high canopy cover, which is defined by you know higher value of NDVI. Uh, similarly, they 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 reduce their movement like when they are in a more forested areas because I because the risk 
from uh, different and anthropogenic and human activities are reduced in certain factors. Uh, while they are in agricultural field or they are close to, you know, they are close to roads, there's a difference in movement behavior. For example, if they, if they move to agriculture, uh, you can see the movement rate is, sorry about that, yeah, thank you. Uh, as you can see, this is you new know, agriculture. If they, are move, if they are in agriculture, their movement rate is very high. And, and also you can see how they modulate their movement when they are close to roads. I mean, when the tigers are moving in a landscape with so many disturbances, they reduce their movement to cross these roads like. And also we see variation among uh, day and night with season with a higher displacement during winters and in summer during. Mm, So uh, apart from that, we also fortunate enough to uh, you know record the long distance dispersal. So as you can, as I have defined, dispersal is a one way movement from its natal area into a new 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 territory. So these individuals we call them walker. He we, we are lucky to you know uh, record on the longest dispersal event, and this 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 uh, this individual has moved uh, aerial distance of around 300 kilometers. Uh, within a within a period of 225 days, and we and we found that this is a very human dominated landscape with forested areas, agriculture, and uh, you know, human habitation. And and we found that this there's a small small patches of forest. How important they are in facilitating this long distance dispersal. And and this was a news overnight. Like you know this 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 was covered by so many so many uh, media like like the New York Post or BBC or uh, Indian media like and I was there always <laughs> and and coming to the space use requirement so I wanted to see how these tigers behave and how much space they require so I use uh, a, a approach called dynamic Brownian Brownian motion uh, and then I calculated the space use in three different scales that is the 50 percent 95 and 99 percent so 55 percent isolated basically the core area where the individual live and 95% is the is the space use uh, they have for their basic requirements. So we found that dispersing tigers had the highest uh, space use followed by post dispersal phase and pre dispersal phase. Uh, this is because you know dispersing tigers has is moving through a human human dominated landscape to different multi use landscapes. Sometimes it has to move to agriculture. Sometimes it has to move fragmented forests. So the space use is higher as compared to the other two phases. Uh, similarly, we also found difference in space use among PAs and outside PAs. Uh, obviously, outside PA they showed higher uh, space use. They also uh, they also have this difference in uh, space use across male and female. Obviously, males are larger in sizes than female, and male has uh, ecologically male has larger areas than female and uh, for an, on an average the, the ratio is like one is to three one male is to three female so males obviously had larger space use requirement and we also see there's a variation in uh, space use requirement according to seasons and then the next part like why these space use has difference like what are the factors governing them so we found that the proportion of uh, uh, and this uh, the model that that showed the best model was a combination of different uh, factors and and try to see what are the factors uh, the governs this space is at different scales for example at 99 percent or at 95 or at 50 percent score area so we found that proportion of land and patch density they negatively influence the space use like uh, if there's an increase in proportion of forest, that means, yes, obviously, there's a contiguous forest, there's high resources, and therefore, there's a space less requirement. However, if there is an increase in patch density, imagine, you know, like more fragmentation, more patch density, and that's how they, they are restricted to smaller areas. So they are bound to have smaller home ranges. And also, we found that how human density uh, influences space use. So with the increase in space, with the increase in human density, there is also an increase in the space requirement. Uh, the second, uh, and then the second section of my thesis was to understand these behavior, uh, like how how we can classify these tiger behaviors, 
and if yes and what factors can influence those behaviors for this i use a hidden markov model which is used to classify uh, the behavior hidden behaviors based on uh, certain movement characteristics uh, basically two movement characteristics were used in this analysis one is the step length so step length is basically the distance between two successive locations the location that you receive from gps callers and then the second component that you we use in HMM is the turn angle, that is the, the angle of uh, successive relocations. With this approach, uh, we identified uh, three uh, behavior states in tigers, the resting state, the area restricted movement and traveling. Basically resting is, as you can see, sleeping or doing nothing. So the, the GPS locations are aggregated in smaller areas. Uh, the area restricted movement or, a fo or foraging is a is a movement in a smaller areas and traveling has a, a longer a trajectory with faster movement and more directional movement so these are the basic three behaviors that were identified from the data from the collared tigers so from the graph you can see uh, how these uh, movement patterns varies according to different states uh, for example uh, tigers in the dispersal phase uh, they have twice the movement as compared to predispersal phases. For example, you can see the traveling. This is uh, the traveling. The tiger travels around 800 meters per hour during predispersal phase, but, but it's twice is in dispersal. This is because it has to negotiate so many you know, risk and factors associated while dispersing. So in order to negotiate uh, different factors, for example, fragmentation or moving in an altered landscape, or human activities, so they uh, modulate this uh, behavior with response to these anthropogenic activities. We also found that different uh, environmental factors influence these behaviors. For example, uh, this is the time of the day. So how time of the day influence or uh, influence the behavior? So these three graphs denotes the three different states of behavior. Like uh, the blue one denotes uh, area restricted movement, while the green denotes the traveling. So we see tigers during the pre-dispersal phase, uh, they are highly active, like uh, this is highly active peaks during early morning and late evening, which shows that these are the crepuscular behavior, uh, which you know from the ecology. And they mostly rest, and their probability of resting increases during the midnight. And their foraging behavior uh, are mostly during the day and peaks around 10 in the, mo 10 in the morning. Uh, similarly, we see some of some behavioral changes of dispersing tigers as you can see there's a difference in the peak in the uh, highly active period like the traveling here we can see only one peak however in this we can see two peaks so dispersing tigers are they are mostly active after dark hours like you know uh, when when the human activities has reduced when there are no activities in the agricultural field or low traffic areas so they increase their this behavior like in terms of traveling so this traveling mostly occurs uh, after eight o'clock. Uh, yeah, mostly after eight o'clock till midnight. And then the probability of resting increases from midnight till early morning. So from this, we see there is a you know, behavioral modulation or change in behavior of, different, of tigers in different reproductive phases. And these are influenced by different uh, environmental and ecological factors. And interestingly, once the tigers they have they establishes a stable home range there is so much of difference in their behaviors because they have, now they are in a defined territory they know the areas like where i have to go where i have to hunt where is my water source and all those stuff so there's a shift in behavior and similarly you also see other factors like you know human population density uh, and temperature which also affects these behavioral states as you can see uh, with the increase in human human population density the tiger probability of traveling increases obviously they have to minimize the risk with the humans and with increase in temperature there is also a difference in behaviors as you can see uh, tigers are likely to travel between the temperature 20 and 30 degrees this is very important in the current scenario of climate change i think because uh, there is always a drastic events of climate activities going across the world and with change in the climate regime, I think this will impact most of the behaviors. 
And also we see how habitat plays an important role in determining these behaviors. For example, in forested areas, uh, the highest probability is to remain in the foraging state. However, once these individuals are in you know, non-forest habitats, they, they shift their behavior to traveling, obviously to you know, negotiate and minimize the risk. And coming to the third part of my uh, research is to understand the uh, resource selection or the habitat selection or what variables uh, influences the habitat, uh, the selection of tigers. So I had uh, tried to understand this uh, habitat selection in two approaches. First at a fine scale and second at a behavior level, like if, you know, if they are resting, like what factors are associated with that? If they are moving, what factors are associated? So I'll just talk in details in the coming slides. So coming to the first part, like fine scale habitat selection. So fine scale habitat selection, imagine it is based on the uh, movement path that an individual takes. So you can see the red line denotes the true step. So this is my true step moving from here to here. And I do a logic, I do a regression uh, with, you know, false steps. Why I'm moving here, not here. So this how the uh, integrated step selection works. And this approach also incorporate the movement parameters. For example, if I am in this forest patch, is my movement speed is greater or slower? If I am in the agricultural landscape, whether my movement is slow or uh, less, if I'm close to some water bodies, if my movement speed is affected by that. So this uh, integrated step selection approach, I identifies all these factors. And I took different kind of variables to understand these uh, habitat characteristics. For example, I took core variables, which is ecologically uh, uh, viable for tiger habitat selection and human disturbances and anthropogenic variables such as human settlement, population density, forest fragmentation. Coming to the results part, uh, we found that human disturbance and forest fragmentation uh, was the best fit model. And we found that variables such as land use, NDVA, distance to drainage, uh, forest fragmentation, human disturbances, they influence the habitat selection. Uh, more uh, details like land use, uh, land use, like different land use type, like forest types, uh, core area equ equivalent to one square kilometers, and vegetation cover, they positively select, they, they positively influence tiger habitat selection and distance to drainage. And tiger avoided areas. Um, which has these agricultural land use, a uh, smaller forest patches. And we found that the movement of these tigers were faster at night. And, and once they approach this uh, drainage system, they reduces their uh, movement. It's like these drainage act as a movement corridor for these tigers while they are moving in this landscape. So while coming to the behavior, uh, behavior specific habitat selection, I just I wanted to see like in different behaviors, what are the variables that influence this habitat selection? For example, if the tiger is resting, what are the variables associated with this? And when the tiger is in area restricted movement or foraging, what are the variables associated? And similarly for traveling. So we found that, you know, during, during pre-dispersal, uh, during pre-dispersal, different variables uh, has uh, influence different behaviors. For example, if you see the the traveling traveling uh, uh, state is uh, influenced by smaller cores and forest edge, while uh, resting is influenced by forest and agriculture. Similarly, for uh, dispersing individuals, uh, we see how how these uh, forest the tigers in forested areas while traveling. Uh, dispersing tigers, they, they travel more in forest and also the, the movement is faster at night. So, and, and post dispersal tigers, they, they, they select grassland for resting and they have this area restricted movement while in forest and grassland. So we see how these behaviors are associated with, uh, differently with different, uh, anthropos, uh, environmental factors. So uh, joining the dots like what I have found so far during my thesis. Uh, so we have uh, like we found that tigers most in outside PA they move faster. They move faster and more at night and they require larger areas and ecologically males require more space use and factors, uh, different factors 
like uh, environmental and anthropogenic factors, for example, uh, vegetation cover, fragmentation, and human disturbances, they influence both boat movement and space use. We identify tiger behavior into three main states, uh, resting, traveling, and foraging, or area-restricted movement. And these behaviors, these tigers modulate their behavior with response to different anthropogenic and environmental variables. And, and they negotiate these behaviors and movement in order to, uh, you know, to minimize their risk with uh, humans and associated uh, uh, and risk. And at last, we could uh, tease apart the different habitat uh, selection and the variables between the fine scale and behavior specific. And we tried to link this outcome of uh, the research into applicable wildlife conservation. So what we did further is that uh, most of these tigers, they crisscross in different uh, landscapes through different you know, uh, places, like sometimes it moves through highways, sometimes through primary roads, and we try to understand how these tigers cross in what in what temporal level and you identify different crossing zones over the landscape and we submitted this report to the federal and the state government and they came up with these mitigation measures like this is one of the longest uh, animal underpass uh, that was constructed in the study area over the time mm. second we also tried to validate these uh, trajectories of dispersing tigers uh, to a model corridors. These are wildlife corridors, which are initially modeled through camera trapping images on, on basis of presence absence. But we try to validate this with real time data and we can see how this, uh, you know, dispersal path is uh, correlated with the model corridor. And we, we took one step further to rebuild this model corridor into a telemetry based wildlife corridors taking you know uh, fine scale data and then model to the entire landscape you can see this the probability of uh, wildlife movement corridors in the landscape uh, unfortunately of the total tiger we colored there were four individual tigers that were electrocuted and we could identify that these these electrician is one of the important uh, threat to the large carnivores in the landscape so imagine like out of 15 tigers, four are electrocuted. There are so many tigers which are uncolored. I mean, we don't have data for that. And then they get electrocuted in such way. And after this report, there are lots of uh, media uh, reports that were collated. And we found that, you know, most of the electrocutions, uh, most of the electrocution happens in these uh, landscapes. And this is because not a direct threat to the tigers, but this is because of, you know, indirect threat to tigers, the villagers in, try, in order to protect their crop fields uh, from ungulates and crop depredation, they, 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 live, they put these live wires and in order to kill those ungulates or deer species. And wild tigers moving in the landscape at night or day, they get electrocuted, unfortunately. And then, and, and taking the data out of it, we have modeled the different areas, which, uh, which denotes like high or medium risk areas and we have shared this data with the state and federal government so they have to take uh, different measures like you know community measurements or patrolling in those areas identified risk uh, more risk conflict areas uh, i'd like to thank all of these people you know this is a long term uh, project that we continued from 2016 to 2022 and these are my supervisors one of his uh, uh, wildlife scientists another is uh, trained veterinarian scientist and these are my field assistant who helped me in my field data collections and these are my colleagues and I would like to thank my collaborators uh, 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 in Swansea University, uh, Wildlife Institute of India, Forest Research Institute and this has led me to come to the University of Maryland to work on you know the human deer uh, interactions to understand the genotic transmission uh, from a wildlife movement sure. angle. Uh, there are obviously other collaborators in this who are looking into the disease part and roughly explaining my, uh, the project that I'm going to work on is, you know, understanding this deer movement and, uh, and how different variables like uh, environmental variables or human mobility, how they influence this deer movement and how these deers are interacting with humans in a very urban landscape and then how uh, this how the disease transmission takes place 
uh, from humans, so deer or deer to humans, and how we can intervene and, and give some management implications. Uh, with that, thank you. I know I was very fast, so I expect very less questions. <laughs> Mm, it's both basically because tigers are densely dependent uh, in uh, densely dependent animals so uh, they doesn't mate with their mothers like you know because of avoiding inbreeding avoiding competitions so they have to move from their natal area and then you know move to a different place in search of new area and habitat. And, and so tigers of different age are they more or less likely to discover? Yes there's a we 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 focus basically on subital tigers which are about to disperse and then and then that way we understood their movement like it's not the adult tigers these are the sub adult tigers so the pre-dispersal movement is it likely just really correlated with that tiger's like matriarch or the, yeah. the group that it's uh, traveling around with early yeah uh, i mean it's like it's a Pre-independence, you know, independence, and then and when you call it these subadult tigers, they are mostly with the mothers, but not totally dependent on their mothers. They also have this uh, individual foraging, uh, forays, and then eventually they uh, completely get independence from their mothers, and then they move out. Okay. Uh, these are very high voltage wires. It is 220 volts. Oh, 220. Yeah, it's a, it's a live wire. Yeah. Otherwise, we use these solar fencings, which gives you shock, but not a direct threat to the individuals. Yeah, but anybody should watch out for 220. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's lethal. Yeah. yeah. So that's intended to kill all. Yes, yes. And also, misfortune happened with humans also. No? <laughs> And these are very illegal. Uh, it's not legal. Um, do you see other kinds of you know, retaliatory killing or preemptive killing? Um, uh, it's something as an aggravation of the system. I'm not sure. I mean, yes. I know initially uh, we had lots of poachings, but because of stringent uh, conservation efforts, this has gone reduced over the years. But yes, they are retal retaliatory killing because of sometimes they ventures into human habitations and but that is in lower proportion yeah and the question of just like mortalities and poaching and illegal wires and things were there collars that you weren't able to retrieve because of that or do you have to do negotiations with people to be like you're not gonna get in trouble i pull my data back or like, <laughs> it was like very difficult like you know there were mobs sometimes and yeah. and to manage a mob is very very, yeah. very difficult like so i had situations with uh, certain situations like that but i mean these electrocations uh uh it's the, the opposite way because they know they're doing some illegal and Tigers are highly protected in India, like uh, they are highly protected and you have these strict, strict uh, rules for, you know, if you kill or poach, you have to have a rigorous uh, seven years jail. Mm -hmm. So yes, people are aware of that, but they also, but uh, I mean, we have certain legal cases and fortunately because of this data, we could, you know, ask them to go to the court like, mm -hmm. and yes. People are sometimes uh, they they behave in negative way. Yeah, I would imagine people don't want to get in trouble, so they just destroy the collar to like. Protect, yes, like, it, yeah. Uh, in one incident, what happened? Interestingly, so I was tracking that tiger. Mm -hmm. So they they removed the collar and then they they left it somewhere, mm -hmm. and they they buried this tiger in a different place, fifth feet down the uh, ground. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we took dogs and other things. Nobody could find it. But after a few days of investigation, the person, he said that he has done this and we could found the body. Wow. Yes. So there's a question online yeah. that I'd like to read up. So um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Adele Shirovahadi um, 
is asking, using a hidden Markov model, did you predict both uh, space and or spatial and temporal resolution um, with your model? For what space and time resolution? Okay, the time, the, the temporal resolution was one hour, and uh, because we have to subset the data into uh, one hour, like. Uh, we had uh, collected this data in varying temporal resolution depending upon the dispersal phases. So yes, we could subset this uh, data into one hour variables. I'm curious as to how you got the collars on the tigers. Like what sedative method? Uh, <laughs> actually, it takes a lot of time in, under in understanding their movement, first of all. Because we have to go to the field, understand their, each tiger has a different behavior. So you have to first, you know, we go to the field, understand each tiger individually, and, and then set up camera traps and see how they are going, in what path they are going. And then we zero in like, okay, this is the month to call it this individual. And my supervisor and us, you know, we call it them with basically uh, uh, this, what you say, ketamine and metatomine. So uh, it's like a 15 period uh, the, from the time of immobilization, we just wait for 15 minutes. Okay. And then once it uh, goes down, so we have to complete it within say 45 minutes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, so you tested like a bunch of landscape variables and their relationship with movement, right, as well as season. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the interaction between season I imagine, you know, depending on season, agriculture may be more. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there's a graph actually, I couldn't <coughs> explain in details, but this dispersing mostly happens during July onwards. This is because with the monsoon phenomenon. So what happens in the monsoon? Uh, so before monsoon, it's a drier period. So there is very less vegetation cover in the forest. These are basically deciduous forests. So during the drier period, say from April to uh, June, it's like nothing is there in the forest. So all dry, no leaves in the trees, and there is no agriculture. So once this monsoon is there, like more heavy rainfall, so everything becomes very green, and the vegetation in the agriculture field also there, like in terms of crops. So this facilitate the dispersing event through these landscapes. So of, there's yes, there's a cover, yes. So it seemed like you found that they moved slower around human settlements, but then faster through non-protected areas. Uh, they move faster through. Yeah, them. I mean, you think that they are slow around the settlements, but then. I mean, if you, if you can if you can tease apart the outside PAs also, like uh, include these settlements and uh, agricultural fields, for example, say you know if 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 I have to, if these tigers approaches a human settlement. Uh, they are more cautious like you know which way to go probably and then waiting for the right time to do that and sometimes these human settlements also provides a surplus of uh, food in terms of cattle so it's the, another way you know to wait and see if they can have these easy preys and in agricultural field it is because to negotiate you know these are fragmented patches so the faster they move the quicker they reach the forested patches on the other side in the or not? No, no, basically not in the, but in the fringe and outside PS, it's everywhere. Had you worked with tigers before your doctorate work? Uh, this, with uh, these anim had you worked with these animals before your research uh, project, before this research project? Uh, before this, I was working in a very smaller species. Uh, I was working on a tortoise, yellow-headed tortoise. But also, it's based on uh, you know this uh, what do you say telemetry. Were you ever like, I can't believe this is my life right now, working <laughs> with tigers, sedating them, and I, don't know, I feel like they're such majestic creatures. You yes, they are majestic. I mean, <laughs> if you if you go and encounter tigers, they are very huge. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of incidents. <laughs> I mean, that time I realized how big they are. I mean. I can, you cannot imagine through a documentary or a picture like, you know, it's a real life experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I apologize if you said this already, but what is the current status of the species? Weren't they previously critically 
some species are critically endangered, but uh, this panther tigris tigris, the, the Bengal tiger is endangered. Uh -huh. No, it's because of so many, uh, and IUCN characterize them in different criteria uh, because their numbers, their habitat, their threats, that's why. Okay, so one thing I was not expecting a long distance dispersal by a female tiger. Oh, okay. So we had, you uh, know, out of the 15 individuals, seven suit dispersal. Out of those seven, one female had a long distance dispersal. So she has traveled around 100 kilometers aerial distance and over a period of three months. That was very interesting. <laughs> Uh, not so, not so, not so. Not as such males, uh, but female do disperse, but we recorded like around 100 kilometers. But the sample size is very low, so we can't say anything. Right on, well, thank you.